Unitis, Part 2. I stand in front of a great pyre. I stand so close the heat stings my face and body, but I do not flinch. The fire, tall as a mighty oak, licks the night air and casts dancing shadows through the trees. A bright new moon appears through thick clouds as Alcis and ten of his priests and priestesses stand in a circle about the flames, intoning the ancient prayers. Alcis leads the group and his voice, a deep bass, thrums through the wood like claps of thunder. He prays to Oiden, Heimdall, Thunir, and of course, Suna, the sun goddess, pleading for mercy, pleading for spring. With each god mentioned, he leads a terrified heifer or sheep to the edge of the blaze and slits its throat, spilling its blood onto the soil. He intones more words over the dying animal. Two of his priests then throw the carcass onto the pyre, and the smell of cooking flesh permeates the air. We answer with the proper words. Farmers from far and wide have donated livestock to the sacrifice, and when all is said and done, over two dozen animals lay burned in the flames. I shake my head, thinking of all the starving people these beasts could have fed. Alsis turns to me when the rite is complete and all is silent, save the sound of the crackling fire. He nods. It is done. Without a word, I turn away from him, and my retinue and I make our way back to the longhouse. It is a slow walk through the snow-filled wood, and I carefully place my feet one in front of the other. I left my sons in the longhouse with Helferich's strongest men, and I am eager to see them again, eager to be out of the cold to ease my aching hands and legs, eager to be out of the gaze of that damned blind priest. A couple of my men are chatting idly behind me, we reach a section of the thick forest where the moon is not as visible, branches obscuring her face. We are bathed in darkness, guided only by our torches. Suddenly, I halt the procession with a wave of my hand. Something is not right. I scan the darkness surrounding us, straining my eyes to see into the thick wood. Every man is on alert, holding his breath. Douse your torches! Fortify! I suddenly yell, but it's too late. It begins as a whistle, a whoosh of air past my face. Before I have time to register what is happening, I turn to see Fuldoin, my most trusted man, crying out in pain, the shaft of an arrow sticking out of his neck. He gasps in surprise and falls to his knees, blood spurting into the snow below him. Ambush! I scream just in time to see black shadows emerge from the darkness, swords and axes glinting in the torchlight. They let out a bone-chilling battle cry and race towards our party. More arrows pierce the air around us and I draw my axe. To the longhouse! Run! I command, but they are upon us. Swords clash and I see another of my men cut down beside me. His attacker is wearing a thick, dark cloak and a covering over his face. But underneath, I notice the glint of bronze armor. Not just any armor. The armor of my most elite troops. Treason! I cry, rage pulsing through my veins, and I heft my axe and swing it into the exposed flesh near his neck. He falls to the ground, screaming in pain. Around me, the sounds of battle continue, and I have trouble distinguishing friend from foe. I run, blood hammering in my ears, all stiffness in my limbs gone. A part of me is oddly pleased to be on the field of battle again, and a slight smile touches my lips. I hack and slash, fending off attacks and swing at cloaked traitors as I pound through the forest. I vaguely feel spatters of coppery blood land on my face, not mine. I must get back to the longhouse and make sure Odelrich is safe. 
After what feels like an eternity, I reach the edge of the wood to the path that leads up to the longhouse. Relieved, I turn and look back. Three of my men stand with me, breathless. Three of the ten I brought with me. The distant screams of wounded men and clacking swords cut through the night air. I gaze down at my hands, now covered in blood, shaking. But something is not right. Where am I? Who, who am I again? What am I doing here? I reach into my mind for some kind of clue, but I am greeted with nothing. No, there's... there's something. Someone. There's... Colin. Colin. Colin! 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 I turned around, breathing hard. Dan and Frank were just behind me also breathing hard. What the hell was that? What the fuck is going on? Dan yelled at me, taking in gulps of air. I don't... What... What happened? You don't know? You were standing right there getting all weird. The next thing we know, you're running through the forest like some kind of goddamn banshee with a flaming shit stick attached to its ass. Frank, through his anger and breathlessness, had the presence of mind to crack a smile at Dan's metaphor. That's enough, Frank said, and reached into his coat to fish out a nine millimeter. He leveled the barrel of the gun at my chest. The muzzle gleamed under the moonlight. You need to turn off your crazy right now. Settle the fuck down and get us to our loot, or... He trailed off. What are you gonna do, shoot me? You son of a bitch. Go ahead, motherfucker. Let me see what you got. I tried to keep my voice calm, but my blood boiled and my head rolled. Hey, 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 Dan said smoothly. All right. Now, I understand we are all a little excited here. I think what my colleague is trying to say is that your behavior is troubling us and he is understandably nervous. Put the gun away, Flavion. There is no need for any of that. Flavion? Your name is Flavion? I guffawed. Hey, that is good name. My mother named me. I held in a smile, and he looked to Dan. Well, at least my name isn't Relish. Relish? Like, like, like the condiment? I burst out laughing seriously. Yeah, well, you know, it's also a, an indication of great enjoyment. What? It's ancient, handed down through the generations. My grandpa was a proud relish, and, and my daddy... Dan trailed off. Hey, it's not a bad name. Watch I don't put you on my hot dog, motherfucker, Frank, or Flavion said. Yeah, 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 real original, Dan grumbled. Flavion and I shared a laugh, and even Dan cracked a smile. The tension broken, Flavion put his weapon back under his coat, into a holster I had just noticed. Okay, okay, enough of that, Dan continued. There's no reason to get testy here. Colin, now can you get us to some loot or what? Sure thing, hot dog, I said and winked. Dan sighed. Despite my newfound humor, I held my hands to my temples. My blood was pounding through my head, and I tried to think through the rushing sensation in my body. Okay, I, uh, I was at a loss for a moment. This was definitely not a good showing for me. But suddenly an idea struck me. Of course, the answer was right in front of me. Okay, I'll take you there. I think I know where some is. They nodded, and I shakily led them back the way we came. We walked in silence. All the while, I counted my breaths and tried to stop my hands from shaking, the memory of the battle rushing through my mind. I brought them to the site of the ambush. It looked much the same as it had a, a moment ago, or four thousand years ago, or whenever that was. I was still having trouble distinguishing time and place. Check here. You sure? Dan said suspiciously. Yes, 
I answered simply and sat with my back to a tree, closing my eyes and taking in gulps of air. The two men began their work, strapping on headgear attached to their metal detectors and dropping their packs and tools to the ground. I was nervous. What if they didn't find anything? What if all this time had erased any trace of the ambush? They moved through the brush, swinging the detectors back and forth across the soggy ground like little toy soldiers. Flavion shot some uneasy glances at me occasionally, but returned his attention to the task at hand. I thought of knocking him over and taking his gun, but I knew I didn't have the presence of mind to pull off something like that. My heart was still racing and my head was pounding. Minutes passed, and I enjoyed my time sitting against the damp tree despite the creeping cold. Here! Dan cried suddenly and threw off his headphones. I, I got something! Here! I was relieved, but still on edge. I could still see the muzzle of the 9 millimeter in my mind's eye and the bulge in Frank Flavion's coat. Come on, start digging! Dan was already hacking at the ground with his shovel. You helping? Flavion asked, glancing at me. No, I answered plainly. He regarded me coolly and began to stab the earth with his mattock. They dug for some time feverishly until Dan exclaimed, Found something! I heard the sound of his shovel hit something metallic. Oops! I heard Dan cry. He bent down and reached into the fresh hole they had dug and removed two lumps covered in mud. I broke the damn thing, I heard him mutter. Flavion turned on his flashlight and aimed it at the two muddy masses. They began rubbing away dirt and mud. Slowly, Flavion's flashlight began to reveal blue-tinged implements. I made my way over and gazed at their handiwork. Two pieces of blue-oxidized metal were glimmering through the damp earth, one an ornate hilt, the other clearly a blade under two feet in length. Holy shit, son, Dan exclaimed. You did it! You broke it, Malaka, Flavion said, lighting a cigarette. Dan shrugged and wrapped the pieces of bronze in a cloth and placed them in his pack. I'm not a damn archaeologist, Dan spat. They'll have to be happy with what they get. Anything else good around here, son? He asked me. I don't know, I replied. It, it depends on how much they cleaned up after the ambush. I, I, I don't know. They looked at me blankly and clearly had no idea what I was talking about. Never mind. You can search more, but, but the main sight is up ahead. Their appetites whetted. The two men fervently searched the area but came up with nothing. We decided to head to the next location. I followed the path by memory, retracing the king's steps as he ran from the ambush. The forest thinned out, and soon we were climbing up a steep hill. My pulse started racing. This was the incline that led to the longhouse. As I plodded forward, my head began to swim, and a rushing sensation filled my body. My breaths began to shorten. Soon my vision was blacking at the edges, and spots of light danced in front of my eyes. I stopped short. It's... it's happening again, I announced to Dan and Flavion. Please don't, I sputtered, but I could feel myself slipping away. Don't fucking shoot me. I'm... shit. I felt the ground begin to rush toward me. My legs no longer worked. I was falling. Falling into blackness. Falling forever. Here we go again, I muttered to myself, and this time I was more prepared for the transfer. I braced myself. Braced myself for what? What was I doing? Running? Falling? Fighting? Who am I? I could see my hands, bloody, tightly holding something. My axe. Breathless, we jogged the rest of the way through the longhouse, weapons drawn. In front of the great doors stands my elder son, Helferich, and a dozen of his closest warriors. Father, he yells, 
a look of concern painted on his face. I run to him and place an arm on his shoulder. I am breathless, and familiar aches are beginning to creep into my fingers and legs as my battle spirit fades from my body. We are surprised, I tell him. I do not know if it was a pinpoint attack or something bigger. Prepare the men to defend the longhouse. Send messengers to my soldiers in the east. We must not let them into the throne room. My son does not move. Helferich seems to search my face with his eyes. I look at him quizzically for a moment. Suddenly a muffled scream emanates from behind the doors of the longhouse. Little Odelric. I can hear furniture being turned over and the muffled cry of a female voice, Ava, Odelric's nursemaid. Understanding washes over me like a giant wave. I stagger back, gazing at my eldest son. No. I choke out. Tears have formed in my eyes. I have imagined every possibility but this. I am sorry, father. Helthoric states plainly, This is the only way. For the good of our people. He draws his long dagger from his waist. My men make a move to stop him, but I hold my hand up. No, they are too many. I gesture to the dozen warriors now moving towards us and surrounding my son. Save yourselves. At least let me die, axe in hand. I growl at my son, who obligingly takes a step back. I draw my weapon, and Helferich comes upon me. He swings his long dagger, and I deftly dodge its blow and slash with my axe, slicing his cheek. You've work to do yet, boy. I sneer at him. This seems to enrage Helferich, and he flails his blade at me wildly. I deflect the blow with the shaft of my war axe and throw my fist into his face. He reels back, blood now pouring from his cheek and eye socket. By now our men have formed a circle around us and watch the dance of death. Some take a knee. My knuckles scream in pain from where I connected with his face, but the pain fades to the back of my mind as my battle spirit floods through my body. Torchlight and the full moon cast strange shadows on my son's face as he holds the side of his head in pain. This blood-stained person does not resemble the man I raised. Is that the best you can do, boy? My tears are now forgotten and my mind has become one with my senses. He may be stronger and younger, but I have been fighting men since long before this pop drew breath. He lets loose a battle cry and runs straight for me, intending to tackle me to the ground. He telegraphs his moves like a green boy and I step aside, flicking my foot out. He trips and falls heavily onto the ground, splaying out like a buffoon. I hear snickers from the men surrounding us. Helferich hefts himself onto his hands and knees, but I swiftly kick him in the stomach, causing him to fall back to earth and clutch his gut in pain. He rolls over onto his back. I stand over him and raise my axe over my head. How dare you, boy, I growl. I'm about to swing the axe down with all of my might, but as I look upon him, he transforms. I suddenly see the baby I held in my arms the night he was born, the night his mother died. I see him sitting upon my lap as a small child while I explain the constellations to him. I see him the day he broke his arm roughhousing with the other boys, hugging me tight as he cried in pain. I see him as a teenager, returning from his first successful raid, a large, goofy grin plastered on his face, lute in tow. I was so proud of him that day. I falter. The axe goes limp in my hands. Suddenly, immense pressure fills my stomach, and the world seesaws, causing me to stagger backward. I look down. I see his long dagger's pommel sticking out of my stomach. He is up on his knees, arms outstretched, hand limp where he has let go of the blade. 
I can no longer feel my legs, and I sink to the ground, landing on my back. An unbearable white hot pain shoots through my midsection, blurring my vision. I see Helferich stand above me. He removes the dagger from my stomach, causing an uncontrollable scream to erupt from my throat. I look into his eyes. They are wet with tears. I am sorry, father, he says, and swings the dagger down again. I manage to reach my hand up and grasp his wrist, holding tightly, but I can feel my strength ebbing. He bats my hand away like it's made of cloth and brings the dagger down wildly. The blade sinks into my collarbone. The bone crunches and rips as he pushes the blade further down. I have never felt more pain in my life, and I open my mouth to cry aloud, but my mouth is filled with a thick, coppery liquid. I am suddenly unable to breathe, and the fire in my lungs causes my body to spasm. Unable to take in air, I reach for something, anything to hold on to. I feel a hand, Helferix. His face hovers inches from mine, and he grips my hand tightly. Let go, father, he says gently, tears still streaming down his face. It's over. I move my lips to speak, but all that escapes from my mouth is the thick, coppery blood. It drips onto the cold earth. I'm slipping away, falling into darkness, my eyes shut for the last time. Suddenly, I'm looking down at my body. I see the back of my son's head, He is resting his face on my chest. The pain is gone. I feel placid, easy, calm. The sky is lit with an overarching glow that permeates all, allowing me to see everything as if the sun shone brightly in the sky. It feels oddly familiar. I feel a call. My body is floating up toward the sky. It would be so easy to let go and drift upward, but I stop. What will happen to my kingdom, my sons, my life's work, this land? The urge is intense and radiates through me. As if in response, I float back to the ground and remain hovering over my body. I watch men pick me up and bring my lifeless corpse to the longhouse. My body is covered in gore, unrecognizable. I can't believe I survived as long as I did with wounds like that. I watch from above as they drag my youngest son, screaming, from the longhouse and lead him through the forest to the sacrificial ground. Alsis, the priest, calmly slits his throat and tosses my son's lifeless body upon the still-burning pyre intoning his prayers all the while. They have been planning this, I realize, for some time. I suddenly feel a hand wrapped around mine, and I look down to my right, only to see my youngest son now holding it. He is smiling at me, and we float wordlessly, each knowing that the pain and terror is over, comforted in each other's presence. Time seems to speed up. Days pass below. Despite their sacrifices, efforts, and prayers, the snow continues to fall. The sky remains cold. My men from the east return, and Odelric and I watch as they slay every single plotter in our murders. There is a great battle on a river. Helferich's loyal soldiers against mine. I watch as my eldest son is cut down from his horse, my men's numbers far too great for him to defeat. They slay Alsis as well, capturing him and flaying him alive in front of a crowd of onlookers. He dies slowly. 
To my left I see Alsis and Helthurich appear beside me. There is no anger, just knowing. Helferich takes my hand and we continue to watch. My most loyal soldiers prepare a funeral for Odelrich and myself. They build a large structure, placing Odelrich's body on my lap. As is our custom, they leave me my jewelry, weapons, shields, and helms for the afterlife. I have a sense that I will have no use for these items where I am going. The land remains cold. More people starve or freeze to death. Their new king, a young man I once knew in my ranks, makes a decision. Now I see my people preparing to move north, abandoning the city and packing their belongings in carts. Before they leave, I see the priests make one last offering to the gods, the sparkling sky disk. They intone their words and bury it near the longhouse with a trove of swords and axes, further gifts to the gods. Indeed, the disk would be useless elsewhere, as it is precisely built to calculate the movement of heavenly bodies from the hill overlooking the city. Time passes, but I remain. I awoke suddenly, my eyes shooting open. I could feel rough bark against my back, and two men came into focus over me. Flavian and Dan, I realized. Dan crouched over me with a bottle of water. Welcome back, magic boy, he said with a grin. Flavian paced restlessly behind him, kicking leaves and fingering the sack containing the old sword. How... How long was I out? I muttered, taking the water and greedily guzzling it down. Oh, about uh, five minutes. Not too bad, man. He stopped and looked at me intensely. You really are something. Got some kind of crazy gift. Reminds me of the old preachers my daddy used to take me to in the country. Yes, amazing, said Flavion, clearly nonplussed. Where is more treasure? I stood and dusted myself off. I gazed down at my hands. They were Colin's hands, smooth and unsullied. I... I trailed off. I wanted to tell them about it, wanted to tell someone, anyone, about what I was seeing, but I made a decision. It's this way. We made our way up the hill to a small thicket of brush. What you're looking for, it's around here. I heard the men begin to unpack their gear and strap on their headsets. I turned away and walked to the edge of the hill overlooking the land below. Through the moonlight, I saw a forest stretch out below me in all directions. In the distance, I could see the lights of the town, Nebra, illuminate the sky, its modern electric lighting casting a purple glow and blotting out the stars. I felt a longing in my chest, a deep sense of bittersweet pain. I looked back at my hands, Colin's hands. The wind swept through my hair, and I sucked in a deep, cleansing breath. I got something, I heard behind me. I knew they would, but their voices were distant, falling off in the wind. I could hear them digging excitedly. I looked up at the stars, the same stars that shined down on Helmsdorf and Odelrich and Helferich and all the people who lived and died in that area for millennia. I turned back around to see Dan and Flavian hoisting objects out of the earth. I casually walked over to see what they had unearthed, though I knew already. They laid out swords, axes, a few pieces of jewelry on the forest floor and were excitedly swinging their mattocks at the earth. There's something here. It's big, Dan yelled and proceeded to smash his mattock into something metallic. Shit, he cursed and began digging with his hands. Soon he was pulling a muddy object out of the hole. It was round, 
covered in earth, but even coated in dirt, I could see the glint of gold and turquoise in the moonlight. The disc. This was a prize for the ages, I knew, and I felt a pang of guilt. It belonged here, not in the grubby hands of some rich looters. There was nothing I could do about that now, though. Besides, I had a feeling it would end up in the right hands some day. The two men brushed it off and gazed at the object they held in their hands. It's a, a shield or, or something, Dan said, running a muddy hand through his hair excitedly. Yes, shield, Flavian repeated, smiling. They began to wrap the objects in cloth and place them in their sacks. Who boy, Dan yelled. What a haul we owe you, magic man. I watched them with a twinge of sadness, but said nothing and looked up at the moon again. Mani, a voice told me in the back of my mind. The moon goddess's name is Mani. Once they packed up the objects, they looked at me expectedly. Anything else, magic boy? Flavian spat at me, but he was cut short by a gust of wind. The temperature suddenly shifted, and a chill filled the air. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up, and the two men suddenly looked very uneasy. I shook my head to say no. There was nothing else for them, but they were no longer looking at me. Flavian had drawn his 9mm and seemed to be looking past me. I turned around and silhouetted in the moonlight. A figure stood on the hill behind us. I hadn't seen anyone coming when I was there a few minutes ago. Instinctively, I backed toward Dan and Flavian. The figure moved closer to us, striding slowly. The air was now ice cold. I shoved my hands into my pockets for warmth. Stop right there, Dan yelled. We don't want no trouble. But the figure seemed not to notice and continued its easy strides in our direction. I have a, a gun. Flavian said, pointing the barrel at the figure. Uh, uh, stop, uh, st stoppen, Flavian continued in broken-sounding German. The air was thick, and we could still not make out the features of the figure with the glare of the full moon behind it. Shakily, Dan reached for his flashlight and flicked it on, aiming the beam at the approaching figure. We stared for a moment. Time stood still. My mouth gaped open. It was him. A large man with graying curly hair and a flecked white beard stood before us. He wore a turquoise cloak and animal skins. A golden bronze circlet covered his temples and his blue eyes pierced the darkness around him. Dried blood covered his chin and beard and his stomach exposed a giant hole with thick crimson seeping from it. His right shoulder was also seeped in blood, and in his hands he held a shining bronze axe. His face held an expression of glaring contempt, but a slight smile touched his bloodless lips when he saw me. Is, is that a, uh, a, a costume, or...? Dan began, but without warning, Flavion fired his 9mm towards the figure as it slowly walked towards us dirt kicked up in the earth behind it, and the reports echoed through the trees, breaking the silence of the forest. He fired again, emptying the mag and kept pulling the trigger when his weapon was empty, to no avail. The unfazed figure continued its slow walk towards us. That was enough for Dan and Flavian, who turned and ran into the thick forest towards the car. Dan had the presence of mind to grab the sack with their loot before sprinting away. I stood, frozen in place, heart pounding. Come on, you fool! I could hear Dan yell as they tore ass through the brush, but I could not. The dead king stepped closer, closer, until I could make out the blood dotting his face and arms, the veins in his cheeks. He stopped and regarded me with bright, inquisitive eyes. It's... it's you, 
I said breathlessly, doing everything in my power to calm my pounding heart. He nodded solemnly in understanding, though I spoke in English. And it is you. I heard the figure speak in perfect English, though his mouth did not move, and I got the feeling he was communicating on a deeper level than words alone. His voice echoed through my mind. I have been waiting for you. A look of sadness passed over his face. He said, and turned away from me. He began to walk toward the lookout. Wait, I... But he was gone. Vanished in the blink of an eye. I had so many questions. The air released its tension. The temperature returned to normal. It was only then that I realized that the forest had been completely silent. No cricket, no owl, or any sign of life had made a sound when the dead king had appeared. An hour later, I was in the car with Flavian and Dan. Luckily, they had waited for me though they had almost left me in the forest. Dawn was appearing on the horizon, and as we made our way down the main highway, German police cars whooshed past us in the direction we had come from. Perhaps they had heard Flavian's ill-conceived gunfire. We were silent. Dan tried to hide his shaking hands in his lap. We arrived at the hotel just as the sun was cresting over the hills. Dan had changed into clean clothes to enter the front and let us in through the back. We see you in a few hours, Flavian said to me in front of the door to my room. It was the first words anyone had spoken since we were on the hilltop. I took a long shower to chase the chill from my bones and dreamlessly slept. I was awoken later with a soft knock on the door. Not bothering to put myself together, I opened it to reveal Dan and Flavion. Their eyes were sunken. They had not slept, though it looked like they had managed to shower. Flavion reached into his coat pocket and produced a thick envelope. For you, he said. Plus extra. I took the currency from his outstretched hand. We go now. Airport, he said. Were those police sirens for us? I asked them. Did they hear us? No, he responded. Unrelated. Then I need to stay for one more day. I'll catch a flight out myself. The two men nervously exchanged glances. Don't worry, I'm not stupid. I'm not going back to the woods. I just don't want to fly today. I shot Flavian a look that said this was my final answer. He shrugged. Suit yourself, kid, Dan said and turned to leave. Wait, I said, turning up the intensity in my voice. I had spent enough time with enough spooks to know how to intimidate when I needed to. Now you two listen to me, Fabio and Hot Dog Man. I need my name completely erased from this. If you two boneheads get caught selling antiquities on the black market, my name must never be mentioned or else. I sucked in a breath. Remember that man we saw in the forest? At the mention of him, their faces grew pale, and Flavion nervously began fiddling for his cigarettes. Yeah, that motherfucker is going to come for you. We talked, and we're in tight. I get in trouble, hurt, anything. That guy will haunt you for the rest of your fucking lives. The lie really worked. They unconsciously backed away from me. All right, all right, magic man, Dan said nervously chuckling and putting his hands up defensively. We would never dream of mentioning you. Not that anything's going to happen to us. You can be sure of that. Our employer would never allow anything to happen to us. He was smiling, but I could see that the threat landed. Good. Glad we understand each other. Pleasure doing business. I shook their hands, 
With that, they turned away, bags in hand, and waltzed out of the hotel. I never saw them again. My mind went back to the disc. I wondered who had their hands on it now. Not my problem, really. I made my way to the lobby to extend my stay and picked up the brochure I had been eyeing on my trips in and out of the hotel. The Halle State Museum of Prehistory. I awoke early the next morning and took a relatively short train ride to Halle, a gorgeous mid-sized city with prominent 16th century architecture. I stood in front of the castle-like museum, gazed at its spires and battlements, coffee in hand, and took a breath before I stepped in. I wasn't exactly sure what I was looking for, but I knew I was in the right place. My intuition had seen to that. The second I had noticed the pamphlet touting the museum, I knew I would be headed there the moment I had a chance. I made my way through its corridors, suits of armor, a skeleton of an oxen, massive statues of ancient gods, beautiful frescoes, a giant woolly mammoth, an artist's rendition of a Neolithic man, and countless other treasures met me at every turn. I took time to appreciate as many objects as I could. But a sign that read Bronzezite and Bronze Age in English below greeted me at an intersection. The sign guided me through the mostly empty corridors, and my footfalls echoed around me as I entered a medium-large showroom. Blue oxidized bronze swords and axe heads of all sizes adorned the walls. A myriad of bone arrowheads lay in lit cases, and small stone statues, each proclaiming to be various ancient gods, stood in small glass displays. I knew that I had found what I was looking for when I saw the prominent glass display case in the center of the room. I felt the pit of my stomach fall out as I walked towards it. Time seemed to slow. Trance-like, I floated forward until my face hovered inches away from the large glass panel. There, splayed out in front of me, were two pieced-together skeletons and a display of daggers and swords, as well as a piece of turquoise encased in bronze, a pendant. One skeleton was smaller than the other. An aged bronze circlet lay near its head, as well as a number of jewels, bracelets, and rings. I instinctively looked down at my hands. Colin's hands. Soft from an easy life. I flexed my fingers and pressed my hands onto the glass, trying to will myself closer to the skeletons. Entschuldigung, I heard a friendly but firm voice say behind me, followed by a string of German words I did not understand. I expected a security guard, but was surprised when I turned to find a smaller man with a bushy beard and thick-rimmed glasses. He wore a lanyard around his neck with an official-looking ID and sported sparkling blue eyes. Uh, uh see, bit of Eng English, I replied, my pulse slightly rising. What if he knew about me or was related in some way to the looters? Ah, of course, so sorry, he said in a jovial voice. Please don't touch the glass. A little bit of relief washed over me. You don't look like a security guard, I smiled back. Ah, yes, no, I am the planner, um, the curator for this exhibit. I work downstairs, I come up to look sometimes, remind me if I work here, he answered and laughed. What brings you to my small corner of the world? Just enjoying the sights. I answered and fixed my gaze on the skeletons laid out on blue velvet cloth. He stood next to me and looked at them with a wry smile. They never cease to amaze me, these two, he said. They are my favorite specimens, with so much still to teach us. Hmm. What can you tell me about them? I asked. Only if you want. I don't know if you have somewhere to be or... 
Oh, nonsense. This is my favorite part of the job. I lead tours too at times, but uh, this is the slow season in the museum. He sipped on a styrofoam cup of coffee. Isn't there no food and drinks allowed? I jabbed at him. <laughs> you are a cheeky one, aren't you? Uh, American? Yes, I replied. From D.C. Uh, Washington, D.C. I have heard of it, yes, he replied, smiling, still sipping his coffee. Uh, what do you want to know about our friends here? Well, I guess I could read the display, but why don't you just tell me about them? He smiled happily in response. This is what he lived for. Ah, very good. They were found in 1877 by art historian um, Friedrich Klopflesch. It is the richest burial ground of this era we have ever come across. This person was buried with high regards and must have been important to his people to be buried with uh, such ostentation. He waved his hand to indicate the swords and jewels. We call him the Prince of Helmsdorf. <laughs> Just a name, of course. King, I said under my breath. Uh, what? He responded. King Helmsdorf, I responded louder. Oh, he paused for a moment, confused, then laughed. <laughs> oh, you joke. Uh, of course, uh, if we do not know for certain what his role in society would have been, uh, most likely he was a minor warlord of some kind that controlled a small area near Lubinchen. The skeletons are far too old to indicate a true king figure in this region of Germany at this time. He probably extorted traitors on the road with a gang of sorts to obtain riches. Or maybe he was related to blacksmiths. He had a special bronze blacksmith's hammer buried with him. Uh, we really don't know. Hmm, must have been the blacksmith guild paying homage to him after his death. I said, still staring at the old bones. Uh, what? The curator responded. I'm sorry, I, I don't uh, understand. What's the other body? I quickly asked. Ah, is that of a ten-year-old boy? Uh, we believe he was sacrificed as uh, an offering uh, to the man who died. Well, you got part of it right, I said quietly, nodding my head and chuckling. The curator continued. The thing that is the most fascinating is the cause of the death. The prince was killed very brutally. A blade pierced his stomach all the way in and crushed the vertebrae of his spine, probably causing him to lose the use of his legs. Very powerful blow. There is also a wound in his collarbone, indicating that the blade crushed it and most likely punctured his lung. Uh, it is uh, perhaps something like a regicide, and if it is, perhaps the oldest one we know of in human history. <laughs> They're fascinating, no? He seemed to relish his description of the gore. I smiled and instinctively took a couple of steps back. The description had brought back memories of the pain, and my knees began to weaken. Yes, very... I replied, swallowing some bile in my throat. These people were very warlike and barbaric. Not a lot of evidence of their culture other than swords and axes. A few jewels, a few crude statues to their gods, uh, nothing more. Uh, unfortunately, I think the um, Hellenistic uh, Greeks or perhaps the Egyptians or, or Hittites, Assyrians, uh, take the prize for the most advanced uh, Bronze Age civilization. <laughs> he laughed as if it were a private joke with himself. Thank you, I said. I believe I have to get going. I turned to leave. Oh, there is one more question I have. Endless winter. Excuse me? The curator responded. Was there a period of endless winter in the Bronze Age, perhaps in his time in Europe? And why would that have been? 
Oh, I see you really know your stuff, the curator said with only a tiny note of condescension in his voice. Yes, there was a period of time when winter would have been longer, though there is no way to say exactly when it happened, and it is impossible to tell if it happened when these two were alive. He pointed idly at the skeletons. Uh, But yes, uh, soil samples suggest that at some point during the early to mid-Bronze Age, a portion of the continent of Europe was plunged into darkness and a much longer winter. Why? I asked again. Well, there was a giant volcanic eruption on the island of Serra. Um, uh, Santorini, it is called now, in Greece. A major disaster that spewed ash and fire into the air. They have found traces of the eruption in Antarctica, even. It would have caused devastation on the continent, blocking out the sun for days or or perhaps uh, weeks, and causing a false winter. He took a sip of his coffee, which, judging from the look on his face, was now cold. Huh. A volcano. Crazy. Never would have guessed, I said to myself as much as to him. Thank you. Before he could respond, I turned and quickly walked away, leaving him to his skeletons and swords. It took a couple of years for the story of the disc to break into the news. I found the article in the post. Two treasure hunters had been arrested for trying to sell the disc and accompanying ceremonial weapons to Swiss authorities posing as buyers. Truth is stranger than fiction. I was nervous for a moment, but chuckled to myself when I saw the supposed looters' pictures. Whoever they credited with the looting and black market sales, it was not Dan or Flavion. Two unfamiliar mugshots looked back at me, and I shook my head. (sighs) Damn, they really must have been connected, I muttered to myself at my kitchen table. Though whoever they worked for was not connected enough to properly navigate and deflect the complex local and international laws surrounding buried treasure. The asking price for the disc on the black market was 400,000 U.S. dollars, though the looters had damaged the artifact while unearthing it, chipping its gold leaf and loosening one of its stars. (laughs) Idiots, I laughed to myself in disgust. According to experts, the disc is the oldest representation of the cosmos in human history. That floored me the oldest representation of the cosmos that we know of in human history. The sophistication and technical prowess involved in creating the disc had completely flabbergasted historians and forced them to rethink their take on Bronze Age Germany. In short, one of the most important finds of the century. I wasn't surprised. The disc is now in the museum I visited in Halle, An ancient legacy countless generations will strive to understand. Even Helmsdorf did not know where the original design for the disc came from, nor the design of the Stone Sky Temple, which still stands today, known as Germany's Stonehenge. So much for a bunch of mindless, barbaric ancient Germans, I said wistfully to my coffee cup. I never spoke to anyone about my incredible experience as King Helmsdorf, and though I tried to explore the phenomenon further, I was never able to fully embody another human being in the same way. Sure, I got close a couple of times, but nothing in my career has ever compared to the connection I had with that dead king. It's for the best, though. My brush with this phenomenon has left lifelong marks on me, and I can only imagine what it would be like if I had connected with more than one person in this way. Sometimes a memory will wash over me and I'll wonder whether it's mine or his. I awake some nights in a cold sweat, a fresh nightmare running through my mind, wondering if an ax head will split my chest open. Other times I'll find myself somewhere, a mall, a sidewalk, standing over the eggs in my frying pan 
and forget where I am, or even who I am. I'll gaze down at my hands and see Collins, wondering where my actual hands have gone. The ones covered in gold and bronze rings, gnarled from battle and probably arthritis. Let me tell you, it is not something you can easily explain to a new date or potential romantic partner when I already work in a field that is hard to explain. It isolates me. A singular experience no one else in the world has had, to my knowledge. There is one recurring dream, though. Each time I have it, it falls through my mind like sand. The dream is expansive, and I always feel that I have learned something each time I awake from it. The sun eventually shines again. Seasons turn. A different generation of my people return. They mingle with the gulls. They are one. But too much time has passed. They have forgotten many of our lessons and remain in separate clans and villages. I roam the forests, watching. Watching them war, eat, drink, die, marry, live. My sons and Alsis eventually leave me for whatever is next. But I must see. I roam the forests alone. A millennia passes in the blink of an eye. A great threat approaches them from the south. Romans, they are called. They use advanced weapons, more durable metals, and superior military tactics, similar to the ones we used in my day. The bloodshed is endless. Battles, occupation, enslavement. I watch them, immovable, always watching. Sometimes I am feared, sometimes revered as a god, but mostly I am forgotten. They intermingle. The Romans leave defeated. Time passes. So much time. Oceans and oceans of time. People come and go. Disease, birth, death, war, marriage, sunrise, sunset. Great stone castles, kings come and go. Always I watch, forgotten. They create loud weapons that kill effectively from long distances. Technology advances, but the people remain the same. They build things I no longer understand, but I know their hearts. That never changes. Greed, desire, Love, lust, envy. A finicky little man finds my bones and moves them to an antiquity showroom. It matters not. They fight a war on a scale I have never seen. I can feel it from my post in the woods and watch it affect Mother Earth in ways I never thought possible. The suffering is endless. Shortly after, there is another war, more destructive than the first. Every tree and raindrop sings of this preposterous struggle. Suffering hangs in the air in ways I never could have imagined. Somehow I remain forgotten, unable or unwilling to go. I do not know which. My forest survives. It is not for some time that he returns. The one who saw me in flesh. The one who was with me when my people lived. The witness, I have called him quietly to myself over this sea of time. I have waited millennia for his return to the wood and for our disk to emerge from the earth. Now the world will know, and I will go. <laughs>